All right, turn to Matthew chapter 8. As you're turning in your Bibles to Matthew 8, um, keep Matt and Karis in prayer as they uh, got married yesterday. I was privileged to do their wedding up at uh, the Nordstrom, well, Brenda's parents' place out in the middle of nowhere between Kremlin and Silverthorne. And uh, if I'm a little red, it's why it was sunny. It was beautiful. And uh, if Matt and Karis are listening to this, sorry I didn't sign your marriage license. <laughs> About halfway home, Elizabeth and I are looking at each other. like, did you say the marriage license? I never even saw the marriage license. Oh, no. Oh, well. It's retroactive. They can have a great honeymoon. They're in a marriage in the eyes of the Lord. And that's like 30, 60 days maybe, I think, is what it is. I don't know. So <laughs> they're probably like, oh, no. Matt will be going, no! Where are we? <laughs> Matthew 8. All right, we're still in Matthew 8. As I mentioned last time, Matthew records 10 very unique, uh, very powerful, uh, very extraordinary miracles, 10 of them in chapters 8 and 9. Uh, again, Matthew is proving to his Jewish audience, because Matthew is writing primarily to the Jews, he's proving to them through what he writes that Jesus is the Jewish Messiah. He is the fulfillment of many Old Testament prophecies. He's a fulfillment of all the Old Testament teachings. At the same time, it's through his miracles that Jesus revealed uh, the Father's love, His grace, His compassion for desperate, hurting people, um, people that needed to know that God really did care for them. And, and Jesus was not just doing miracles for the sake of doing miracles, but there was meaning, uh, there was purpose behind everything He's doing, primarily to glorify the Father, also to, again, prove that He's the Messiah, and also to demonstrate God's love and compassion to the multitudes of people. And so, we left off with Jesus touching the untouchable, that leper that he healed. He touched him, healed him, and he was completely restored. And then um, he heals the uh, centurion's servant with just a spoken word. And, you know, the servants, uh, the centurion's like, you're not even worthy to come under my house. You speak the word. And Jesus did. He marveled at the man's faith. And that guy was healed, his servant. And then he goes to Peter's home there in Capernaum, Capernaum. And um, Peter's mother-in-law, so again, the first pope was married, so get over it. And uh, so uh, he raises up Peter's mother-in-law. She's healed. She begins to serve them. And so now we pick up in chapter 8, verse 16, and it says, When evening had come, they brought to him many who were demon-possessed. And he cast out the spirits with a word and healed all who were sick. So again, an incredible scene here before us. Notice it says, many who were demon-possessed were brought to him, and, and he just casts them out with a, a spoken word. Now, in Luke's gospel, he gives us a little more information about this same scene here. Uh, look at this verse in Luke 4, verse 41. It says, and demons also came out of many, crying out and saying, you are the Christ, the Son of God. And he, that's Jesus, rebuking them, did not allow them to speak, for they knew that he was the Christ. So it's interesting to me that the demons never had any issues about who Jesus Christ is. They know who he is. They know he's the only begotten Son of God. They know he's co-creator of the heavens and the earth. They knew that he was the Lord of lords and the King of kings. But Jesus always shut them up. He kept them from speaking. After all, Jesus didn't want and he certainly did not need uh, any kind of endorsement from these demons, these fallen angels. Notice also in this verse it says that Jesus healed all who were sick. To appreciate the multitude of what's happening this day, uh, look at this verse because Mark speaks of this. Mark chapter 1, verse 33. Mark writes, and the whole city was gathered together at the door. So this was amazing. Nothing like this had ever been done in human history. I mean, think about it. As fast as people could be brought to Jesus, as fast as he was touching them, they were instantly being healed. 
I mean, blind eyes open, deaf ears open, lepers, boom, their fingers pop back on, their faces back to normal, their skin just like a baby's skin. I mean, he is casting out demons. You know, he's not only healing people physically, but spiritually restoring uh, these people as he's casting these demons out of them. So what a night this must have been. I mean, Jesus is literally stepping into Satan's territory. Satan's the god of this world. And he is just doing amazing things as he takes charge for a season at this time. In the big picture, this is like a preview of coming attractions. Because when, a, when Jesus establishes his church a few years later than this, on the day of Pentecost, Peter preaches the gospel. 3,000 people get saved just on that very day. Again, a person's salvation is the greatest miracle of all. People say, I want to see miracles. Well, the greatest miracle there is, is when somebody gives their life to Christ, he comes into their life, and it's at that very moment that he changes you. He washes all of your sins away through the power of his blood. He makes you a new creation where old things pass away, behold, all things become new. It's at that very moment that when Jesus comes into your life, He gives you eternal life. He justifies you. That means He declares you righteous before the Father. Uh, You're adopted into His family. And there's just a whole list of all these blessings that happen at the moment of salvation. But then also think of the billions of people over the last 2,000 years that have gotten saved, that have come into the family of God, who've been delivered from Satan's domain of darkness. They've been transferred, like we have, into the kingdom of His beloved Son, in whom we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins. And then when Jesus establishes His earthly kingdom that we know is in the future, and it will last for 1,000 years It's going to be amazing because he will again, and this is what we're seeing a preview, what he did then in a short amount of time, he's going to do for a thousand years. There's going to be no more people getting sick, or if they do, those in their natural bodies in the millennium, he will heal them. He will protect them. He will get them through it safely. Uh, People will live for a thousand years at that time. It's going to be like before Adam and Eve fell. It's going to be uh, amazing beyond comprehension. So what he's doing here is like a foretaste of what he's going to do in the future. What he did on this very special evening in Capernaum, Matthew tells us why he did this in verse 17. Look at what he says here. He's healing, casting out demons, verse 17, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet, saying, he himself took our infirmities, and bore our sicknesses. So Matthew here, he's quoting from Isaiah 53. And again, Matthew quotes more from the Old Testament than any other gospel writer because he's demonstrating to the Jews he's the fulfillment of our scriptures. There's a few verses here in Isaiah 53 I want to look at. Isaiah 53, verse 4. It says, surely he, speaking of Jesus, has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Take note of those words, borne and carried. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. When it says he has borne our griefs, the word borne means to bear something for another person. The word griefs there in the Hebrew means sicknesses. So he has borne our sicknesses. Then it says Jesus has carried our sorrows. Again, the word carry there means to carry something uh, vicariously for another person. And then the word he uses for sorrows literally means our pains. Isaiah uses the same two words, born and carried. Look at these verses, Isaiah 53, 11 and 12. He shall see the labor of his soul and be satisfied. This is speaking of Jesus on the cross, laboring on the cross. By his knowledge, my righteous servant shall justify many. For he shall, notice, bear their iniquities, again, carrying our sorrows, carrying our sins, Then he says in verse 12, Therefore I will divide him a portion with the great. He shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out his soul unto death, and he was numbered with the transgressors. Remember the two thieves being crucified next to him. 
And he bore the sin of many. Same word used in verse 4. He has borne our griefs on behalf of others. Here he has borne our sins. So Jesus bore the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. So all of that would be fulfilled on the cross. Jesus would take our pain, take our sicknesses, he would take our sorrows, he would take our grief, and he would take it upon himself for all of us who would call upon him as Lord and Savior. Now, it should be obvious to every one of us in here, when you wake up a little stiff in the morning, or you catch a cold, or whatever it might be, that we don't experience complete healing all the time in this life. If you are healed of every sickness, every disease, every infirmity here and now, guess what? You and I would never die. The only reason we're going to die is because we're going to get something that is going to make us sick and we'll become ill or we'll have something happen and then eventually your heart will give out or whatever it might be. So that should be obvious that this is not always the case, that everybody's going to be healed of everything. The ultimate fulfillment of all these promises will take place when we stand before the Lord in glory. And we just sang a song that dealt with that. You know, Revelation 21, verses 3 and 4, this is when we are in our glorified bodies, and it says, And I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men. This is in the New Jerusalem. And he will dwell with them. That's with all of us. And they shall be his people. God himself will be with them and be their God. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. This is when it happens. There shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. There shall be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. So in the meantime, we need to be open to everything that God wants to do in our lives. He may choose to heal you physically, or because He's God, He may say, No, I've got something better for you than a temporary physical healing. And we need to be open to what the Lord wants to do. Remember the Apostle Paul. Great example. I mean, he had this thorn in his side, some kind of a physical infirmity, we're told. We're not told exactly what it is. My, if I had to guess, I'd say something with his eyes because he talks to the Galatians about you know, how I had to write with such big writing. And he talks about the, to the Galatians, if, if possible, you'd give me your own eyes. And so maybe it was something to do with his eyes. We don't know for sure. That's, we're not supposed to know because it can cover a lot of different things that we face. But three times he pleads, literally means he begs the Lord, to heal him, to take this thorn away from him. This is what we read in 2 Corinthians 12, verse 9. Paul says, And he said to me, this is Jesus speaking to Paul, My grace is sufficient for you, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. And then Paul says, this is kind of strange if you don't know, you know what he's referring to. He says, Therefore, most gladly, I will rather boast in my infirmities. That doesn't fly in the Word of Faith churches, does it? Boasting in your infirmities? That the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities. You're twisted, Paul. No, he's not. I take pleasure in infirmities and in reproaches and needs and persecutions and distresses. He says, for Christ's sake, for when I am weak, then I am strong. How could Paul say that? Because his strength came from Jesus. And it was when he was weak that he needed the strength of the Lord more than ever. It was when he was just worn out or physically unable to carry on. He had to rely on the Lord to get him through it and to uh, trust the Lord in that difficult situation. So the bottom line when it comes to healing is this. Jesus is the great physician. And he is able to heal anyone of anything, but at the same time, he knows what we need in order to cause the maximum growth in our lives. That's the bottom line. He knows what you need to cause the maximum growth in your life. We don't always like that, but we got to trust the Lord. That's where real faith and growth develops. As we look to Jesus, as we trust him, 
And we believe that He is literally causing all things to work together for our good. That's where faith comes in. So don't put your faith in your faith like you've got to work something up and then you're going to be healed. No, you put your faith in the Lord and trust Him for what He wants to do in your life. So moving on, look at verse 18. And when Jesus saw great multitudes about Him, He gave a command to depart to the other side. The crowds are getting out of control. Later on, we'll see that the crowds will want to take him by force and make him king. And it says he withdrew from them because they wanted to make him king because he was feeding them a lot of fish and bread. Remember from the little boy's lunchbox? You know, this little kid's got a Lunchable. Jesus takes a little Lunchable, divides it up, and 5,000 men plus their wives plus their kids are fed. But there's little lunchable. That's a miracle, folks. And it says literally that they were stuffed full. It's like Thanksgiving. It's like you got to put on your stretchy pants. You're just like, I can't eat another bite. Oh, there's pie. You know, that's how it was with these guys. They were just stuffed. Anyway. <laughs> Jesus tells them the crowds are getting big. He says, this is a command. I want you guys to depart to the other side. Jesus didn't come 2,000 years ago to be a politician appealing to the masses of people. He came specifically to be the Lamb of God that would die on the cross for our sins. That's the whole reason why Jesus came. He was the perfect sacrifice for sins. And so even though he made it clear that he was the promised Messiah by doing all these miracles and healings, his goal was for the people to realize the most important thing you need is not physical. You need your sins washed away. You need your sins forgiven. You need to come into a relationship with God. After all, it's our sins that separate us from God. But Jesus came to break down that wall of separation and give people the opportunity to come into this relationship with God through Jesus. And He gives us everlasting life. So again, he's not impressed with the crowds of people. In fact, we often see him taking his disciples away from the crowds, and that's what Jesus is doing here. The crowds are growing, so he tells his disciples, again, take note of this in verse 18. He's, he's, we'll see in other verses. He's telling them, get in the boat. We're going to the other side of the Sea of Galilee. That's what he's going to tell them. So they head down to the water at Cap. Capernaum, Capernaum. And this is what happens as they're walking from Peter's house down to the shore. Verse 19, Then a certain scribe came and said to him, Teacher, I will follow you wherever you go. Sounds good. The scribes, they're very important people in Israel. They copied down the Old Testament scriptures. They were very meticulous in what they did. You know, they were the ones they would see the Old Testament scroll and they would have to go letter by letter and transpose that over to the next one because this one's wearing out. We've got to make a new scroll. So these scribes were very important. That was an important job. It also meant they knew the scriptures really well because they're going word for word, transposing the, that scripture onto another page. He probably recognizes Jesus as the Messiah. And so these guys are, um, well, this guy particularly, he says, I'll follow you wherever you go. Now, interesting thing about scribes, most all of them are very wealthy people in Israel. So this is what Jesus tells this man, similar to what he tells the rich young ruler. Jesus said to him, verse 20, foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests. But the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. Well, he makes it clear here. The foxes and the birds, they have their homes. This is their environment in this world. But he says, I have nowhere to lay my head. Now take note of a couple of important things here. I find very interesting. This is the first time Jesus uses this messianic title, the Son of Man. It's a favorite title that he uses many times, but it comes from the book of Daniel. Daniel sees this vision. He has this dream, this vision, and he sees the Antichrist kingdom starting to grow. But then he sees the Son of Man coming and destroying the kingdom of the Antichrist and establishing his own kingdom. 
So look at these verses, Daniel 7, verse 13 and 14. Daniel writes, I was watching in the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man. That's a messianic title. Coming with the clouds of heaven. So that sounds like, you know, Revelation 19. We're coming back with the Lord. He came to the Ancient of Days, and they brought him near before him. Then to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion, which shall not pass away. And his kingdom, the one which will, shall not be destroyed." And so the Son of Man, again, it's one of his favorite titles. So here's Jesus, the Son of Man, the King of Kings, the Messiah. No place to lay his head? You know, that sounds kind of like an oxymoron. An oxymoron is simply, well, you're thinking you're an oxymoron. <laughs> no, that's not what it means. It's the two opposite concepts. How could the ruler, the creator of the heavens and the earth, have no place to lay his head? Didn't he have a designer bed? Didn't he wear designer robes? Didn't he drive around in a designer chariot? That's what the Word of Faith wants you to believe. That's a bunch of baloney. He says the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. Back in chapter 4, we saw in the temptation, Satan, one of the temptations was, take him up on this high mountain, show him all the kingdoms of the earth. And Satan says, if you'll just bow down and worship me, I will give you all these kingdoms. That's what Satan is telling Jesus. Because Jesus didn't argue with him. Jesus knew, yes, this world is Satan's. He's called the God of this world. At the second coming of Christ, after Jesus takes the scroll, takes off the seals on the scroll, he reclaims his world back to the Father once and for all. But presently, this world is not Jesus' home. Only at the second coming does, it, does he take it from Satan. Now this phrase, though, to lay his head. He had nowhere to lay his head. There's a couple Greek words that say they lay his head. There's another place the exact same Greek words are found. Only one other place. And Jesus says these words. John 19, verse 30. This is Jesus dying on the cross. So when Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, It is finished, and bowing his head. Exact same Greek words as lay down his head. Bowing his head, he gave up his spirit. So Jesus finally did find a place to lay down his head on the cross. Again, for you and for me, for our sins. He paid the price. It is finished. Paid in full. His blood. So, you think you want to follow Jesus wherever He goes. You better count the cost. That's what this whole thing is about with this man, and then the next guy we'll see. you got to count the cost. It will cost you your very life. That's exactly what Jesus tells us. Look at Luke 9, verse 23. Jesus says to them all, If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow me. Well, I've got these books, your best life now. I'm, I'm supposed to be blessed. I should have all this stuff given to me. I just need to claim it. That's garbage, folks. Jesus says, No, you want to be my disciple? You deny yourself. It's not about you. It's about Jesus. It's never been about us. He didn't die to make cuddly little creatures better. Are you kidding me? He died for us, sinful people who rebelled against Him. And our only hope is to go to heaven and be saved by Him. And so we don't tell Him what to do and how to do it. We deny ourselves, take up our cross, and guess what? The greatest thing of all is to follow Him. And He's the good shepherd, and you know when you're following Him, He's not going to do you wrong. He's going to do what's best for you. He's going to bless you beyond comprehension, but it's always different than what we think. The Apostle Paul certainly understood this. He definitely counted the cost of following Jesus. This is what he says in Galatians 2, verse 20. Paul writes, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. 
In the life which I now live in the flesh, in this body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Isn't that amazing? I mean, that is true discipleship. That is following Jesus. It's not me living. It's Christ living in me. And even this life I now have, it's not about me. It's about letting the Lord work in me, work through me. I'm walking by faith and not by sight. Again, we need to count the cost of following Jesus. He did not promise you sunshine and roses and a smooth journey in this life. He says just the opposite. In this world, you'll have tribulation. Take courage, I've overcome the world. He tells us to expect difficult days, heartache, persecution. The important thing to know is this. For all of us who have given our lives to Jesus, who have been born again, we've been saved by the blood of the Lamb, is that Jesus now dwells within us. He has promised us that He will never leave us nor forsake us. And yet at the same time, He is preparing a glorious place for us in the, new, you know, the, the city of New Jerusalem. And so when I count the cost of following Jesus, it all adds up to Jesus outweighing anything and everything this world could give me. That's what you need to do. Count the cost. Is Jesus worth it to follow Him? Or would you say, oh, man, for a billion dollars? I might trade that in for Jesus and take the billion. Are you kidding me? That's not going to get you anywhere. You'll probably die sooner than later. You can't take it with you. Jesus, it's all about Him. When you add up everything He's done for us, again, He's justified us. He's made us new creations. He's washed our sins away. He's preparing a place in heaven. I'm going to be with Him for eternity. Nothing that the enemy could tempt me with would be greater than that, than what Christ has offered me. So this scribe comes to Jesus. He reacts too quickly. Oh, I'll follow you wherever you go. Oh, really? I don't have a place to lay my head. You want to turn in all your money and follow me out in the middle of nowhere? Well, I don't know. It doesn't tell us what happens with this guy, but like the rich young ruler, he departed all sorrowful because he had a lot of wealth. This next guy, though, look at him. He reacts too slowly. He's a procrastinator. Verse 21, Then another of his disciples said to him, Lord, let me first. Wait a minute, you can't say that. Lord, let me first go and bury my father. But Jesus said to him, Follow me and let the dead bury their own dead. A lot of people look at that and say, whoa, Jesus is kind of callous there. He's kind of mean towards this guy. He's got a father that's dead and he can't even bury him. What's the deal? That's not what he's talking about here. A couple of things to note, very important. First of all, never come to Jesus and say, Lord, me first. Lord, let me first. That's not how our relationship with Jesus is supposed to work. What do we just see in chapter 6, verse 33? But seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. So we should always be mindful that Jesus is first and foremost, not us. If we put Jesus first, He'll take care of the rest. That's where true faith comes in. You, you trust the Lord. You put Him first in everything, and He'll take care of you. You are His child. He loves you. He will provide some way, somehow. Again, I know that we're all guilty of putting ourselves first at some time or another. Even Peter did. Remember when the Lord lowered down that sheet to Peter, and it was full of all those unclean animals? This is what we read in Acts 10, verse 13. It says, A voice came to him, Rise, Peter, kill and eat. But Peter said, Not so, Lord. Again, you can't tell God not so. Who do you think you are? He says, For I've never eaten anything common or unclean. But the Lord told him, What God has cleansed, you must not call common. And then it says it happened three times. Now here with this guy saying to Jesus, Lord, let me first go and bury my father. The problem is the father, the father hasn't died. The father's probably not even close to death. The, problem, the father's probably got 20 or 30 years to live still. He's talking about his family responsibility to take care of his parents as they get older and then they eventually die. 
That's a good thing. But this guy's like, no, I need to go and hang out with my dad for the next 20 or 30 years. And then once he's dead and buried, then I'll come and follow you. That's not how it works. That's like, and I've heard this many times over the years. People say, you know what? I'll wait until I retire, until I start to follow Jesus and take him seriously. When I turn 65 or 67 or whatever it is, then I'll follow the Lord. Then I'll get serious about the Lord. That is so wrong. You don't know what tomorrow holds. You don't know how long your life is going to be. If you're in your 50s now, you can't say, well, I'll wait till I retire, and then I'll take Jesus seriously. You might not have tomorrow. I look at the obituaries all the time. It's interesting because it used to be you'd see, and they're going to have a church service for this person, and they're going to have, a, and they, you know, they believed in Jesus. More and more, it's like not very many are believers. It's getting sad. There's no hope without Jesus. But again, there's no guarantee that you've got tomorrow, 10, 20, 30 years down the road. We need to serve the Lord now. We need to be serious about our walk with Him always. Paul writes this. Well, this is with a sense of urgency. 2 Corinthians 6, verses 1 and 2. Paul writes, We then, as workers together with Him, also plead with you not to receive the grace of God in vain. For He says, In an acceptable time I have heard you, and in the day of salvation I have helped you. Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. And that's what Jesus is telling this guy. Follow me. He's literally saying, let the spiritually dead bury the physically dead. He's challenging this guy and his priorities. Is it not better to proclaim the gospel of Christ to those who are spiritually dead in their sins? That's why we go to India. There's people that are spiritually blind. They're in darkness. We want to go there, bring the light, bring the gospel of Jesus Christ to them. We want to see them have new life in Jesus. That's more important than to hang around your house for the next 20 years waiting for your dad to die. And then, oh, then I'll bury him. No. Anyway, verse 23, we come to one of my favorite Stories in the New Testament here. He says, Now when he got into a boat, his disciples followed him. Again, remember what I said back in chapter uh, 8, verse 13 or 18, Jesus gave the command to depart to the other side. Jesus' exact words are recorded in Mark chapter 4, 35 and Luke 8, 22. Jesus says, Let us cross over to the other side of the lake, the Sea of Galilee. That's the word of the Lord. Remember that. Verse 24. And suddenly a great tempest arose on the sea so that the boat was covered with the waves. But he was asleep. This is the only scene in the Bible where we find Jesus falling asleep. And not only is Jesus fully God, but remember he was fully man. He was tempted in all points like we are, yet without sin. But in his human body, he got tired. Again, this was a long day. We're still in the same day as when he went up the mountain, back in chapter 5, preached the Sermon on the Mount to great multitudes, came back down with great multitudes. He's healed the leper. You know, he healed the centurion's servant. He raises up Peter's um, mother-in-law. He's got multitudes of people all day long coming to be touched and healed. He's worn out. And so he says, okay, let's get in the boat. We're crossing over to the other side. And as soon as they get in the boat and they take off, he, he's fast asleep. He was in his physical body. He had limitations in some ways. But they start crossing, and he quickly falls asleep. We also read, as you go through the New Testament, Jesus gets hungry. He gets thirsty. He grieves. Remember, he cries at the tomb of Lazarus. He will experience Great pain and agony as he's beaten and nailed to the cross. But here he is fast asleep. But as we'll see, he's still in full control. You know, he didn't lose sight of what's going on. He didn't, like, fall asleep and ignore them. Don't ever think Jesus is asleep and he doesn't know what's going on. Sometimes you and I might think, wow, he nodded off. And, and you know, that's why this bad thing happened to me. He must have fallen asleep. It doesn't happen that way. When we go through a severe storm in life, Jesus 
knows exactly what's going on. And he wants us to realize that he is in complete control. Even as Jesus is resting in the storm, so can you and I. Look at verse 25. Then his disciple, well, suddenly a tempest rose in the sea, so the boat was covered with waves, but he was asleep. Verse 25, then his disciples came to him and woke him, saying, Lord, save us, we are perishing. Now, it's interesting here because in, in uh, Mark's gospel, they also say when they wake him up, Lord, don't you care that we are perishing? We know this storm was a bad one because you've got uh, probably about seven seasoned fishermen in this boat with Jesus. Matthew hasn't been called yet. That's in chapter 10. But here we've got these seven seasoned fishermen in this boat Who's, with this guy who's a carpenter. And anytime you got seasoned fishermen freaking out, waking up a carpenter for help, you know you're in trouble. And so I've, I've been on the Sea of Galilee four times. I've never seen anything like this. Um, again, the Sea of Galilee, we think of sea. It's not a sea. It's really a lake. It's 13 miles long. It's eight miles wide. Um, I've seen pictures, though. You can Google pictures of storms in the Sea of Galilee. They can get waves six to eight feet high on a lake. That's incredible. How could that happen? Well, remember, the Sea of Galilee is about 680 feet below sea level. You've got Mount Hermon, which is like 10,000 feet, usually snow-capped, just to the north. You've got the Mediterranean Sea just to the west. And so you can get some weird weather patterns at times where it'll just come in and swoop down, you know, 680 feet below sea level. The winds will go down, shoot down there and cause these waves to come up. I've seen pictures of it. It looks crazy. So here they're caught in this big storm. Literally, these guys are freaking out. Lord, save us. Don't you care? We're perishing. We're taking on water. We're going under. So... This is what Jesus says in verse 26. He said to them, Why are you fearful, O you of little faith? Then he arose and rebuked the winds and the sea, and there was a great calm. So the men marveled, saying, Who can this be, that even the winds and sea obey him? So why are you so fearful, O you of little faith? They would probably say, I'll tell you why we're fearful. You're sleeping. We're going to sink. We got water coming in the boat. That's why we're freaking out. And so Jesus is teaching them. He's teaching us some very valuable lessons through this. First of all, his word, get in the boat. We're going to the other side. So they need to understand and hold fast to the word of God. Romans 10, 17. What does it say? So then faith comes by hearing, hearing comes by the Word of God. The first thing we need for our faith to grow is to be in the Word, to study the Word, to believe the Word, to hold fast to God's Word. Again, Jesus gave them His Word before the storm ever hit. Get in the boat. The promise is we're crossing over to the other side. He didn't say we're going under. Again, he didn't promise them a smooth trip. He didn't say, oh, yeah, get in the boat. We're just going to have a nice, you know, calm float across the Sea of Galilee. That's not what he told them. He didn't tell them what was going to happen. On the, another important point to learn through this situation is that this was all a part of Jesus' plan to increase their faith, to strengthen their faith and trust in him. This is exactly why Jesus allows storms to come into our lives. He wants our faith to grow. He wants us to trust Him even when things look bleak and dark. It's been said as Christians, we are either going into a storm or we're in a storm or we're coming out of a storm. And that's true in a lot of ways. But you know, there are a lot of different types of storms that can come our way. These disciples are experiencing a literal storm. Waves, wind, they're about to, you know, taking on water. This is a storm to prepare them for what was coming in their future. Here's a great definition of a storm. 
when normal weather patterns are disrupted. Think of that, when normal weather patterns are disrupted. In other words, we can get accustomed to living in a normal weather pattern. Oh, yeah, it's a beautiful day. It's going to be sunny. Yeah, we'll probably have light breezes later on. Tomorrow, yeah, I looked at the weather forecast. It's going to be another nice day. The temperature is going to be in the 70s. It's going to be a beautiful day. And we just get into this rut of knowing this is my schedule. This is my routine. But when a storm comes into our lives, it's a disruption. And sometimes it's a big storm with big disruptions. But here's something that's also important to see in this story. This storm did not come upon them because they were disobedient. Remember that. The storm didn't hit them because they were doing something bad or wrong or sinful. No, this storm came upon them even though they were obedient to what Jesus said. Jesus said, get in the boat, we're going the other side. They're like, okay, they obeyed the Lord, and the storm still came. Sometimes we can bring a storm upon ourselves, like the prophet Jonah. Remember when Jonah rebelled against the Lord, God says to Jonah, I want you to go to the Ninevites, preach the word to them, tell them to repent. He's like, no, I'm not doing that. I'm getting on a boat. I'm going to Tarsus. He gets on the boat. God brought a storm to stop them. And then they draw straws. It comes down to Jonah. He said, hey, just throw me overboard. I'm the reason why you're in this storm. So they said, okay, you're out of here. They throw him in the water. And God sends the whale, the giant fish, to swallow him up for three days, three nights. God directs him to the beach. He barfs him up on the beach. And there's Jonah, you know, just all seaweed hanging off of him. Okay, I'll go to Nineveh. And he goes there, he preaches. They, they guesstimate 200,000 people in Nineveh repented. And then Jonah's mad because they all repented. I knew they were going to do that because you're such a good God. You're so gracious and merciful. So God sent that storm because it was a storm of correction. But there are also storms of instruction and for our maturity, and that's what is happening here. They're in a brutal storm because they were obedient to Jesus. They did exactly what he told them to do. And sometimes it's in those storms where we get the most confused. Lord, I don't understand. Why is this happening? I'm reading the Word. I believe what your Word says. I'm trusting you every step of the way. And now my normal life has been severely disrupted. Why is this happening? Again, the storm didn't come upon them because they had a lack of faith, but the storm simply was used to reveal how little their faith in Jesus was at that moment in their lives. But that's okay because these are new Christians. Christians, what even the term yet, but these are baby followers of Jesus at this point in their lives. They're learning to walk with the Lord. They're learning to trust Him. The faith of all these men would continue to grow stronger and stronger as the years would go by. In fact, all of them, except for the Apostle John, would go through tremendous trials and persecutions and horrible deaths. Peter, they say, was crucified upside down. They tried to boil Paul or John in oil, but it says it didn't touch him. So then he gets banished to the island of Patmos because God wasn't done with John. He had the book of Revelation for him to write. But so many, they went through brutal torture, brutal martyrdom. You might think, well, that sounds like the storms overwhelmed them. It sounds like they were defeated. It sounds like they went under. They didn't go over. Not at all, because the promise of Jesus never left them. Get in the boat. We're crossing over to the other side. And I can guarantee that all those apostles experienced that reality more than ever when they took their final breath here on earth. And they took their first breath in the presence of Jesus in glory. And Jesus said to them, Well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of your Lord. And they had crossed over victoriously to the other side. So if you're going through a storm right now in your life, don't listen to people who are judging you, who may be pointing fingers at you. Remember Job's friends? Oh, this is why you're going through this, Job. And they didn't have a clue. God was doing so much more that they couldn't even comprehend. But when you're going through something, just draw near to Jesus. 
Ask Him to strengthen your faith and trust in Him because He wants you to know. He doesn't want you to have any doubts that He is in the boat. He's going through that storm with you at this moment. And in His time, He will calm the storm. Amen? We're not done. Sorry. <laughs> Look at these verses. I, I, this, I'm sure this must have gone through these disciples' minds at some point. Psalm 107, starting in verse 23. I love this. Those who go down to the sea in ships, who do business on great waters, they see the works of the Lord and His wonders in the deep. For he commands and raises the stormy wind. Sounds like God's in control. Which lifts up the waves of the sea. They mount up to the heavens. They go down again to the depths. Their soul melts because of trouble. They reel to and fro and stagger like a drunken man and are at their wit's end. Lord, save us! Then they cry out to the Lord in their trouble, and He brings them out of their distresses. He calms the storm so that its waves are still. Then they are glad because they are quiet. So He guides them to their desired haven. Oh, that men would give thanks to the Lord for His goodness and for His wonderful works to the children of men. Now, amen.